Joining me this evening, the Right Reverend Rose Hudson Wilkin, the first female black bishop in the UK. Born in Jamaica, uh, Rose was only 14 when she felt a call to the ministry and wanted to pursue a career in the church. In 2019, she made history after being installed as the Bishop of Dover, making her the first black female bishop in the UK. Throughout her career, Bishop Rose has faced many challenges, including racism and sexism from church leaders, but she's made her mark on the Church of England. I'm really pleased to say uh, that the Right Reverend Rose Hudson Wilkin joins me on Times Radio now. Good morning to you, Rose. Hello, good morning. Do I just address you as Rose or do I... Please do, please do. (laughs) Well, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Let's set the scene, first of all, um, because your early life is really important here. You were born and raised in Jamaica. Your mum Mm. left for England, like many in her generation, Mm. um, to pursue work. um, And you were in the care of your auntie pet who looked after you and your mum came back. I mean, this was, you know, again, a common story. Either children left behind would would go to England or parents would come back. Yes. But, but your mum came back with. A yes, new she family. came back with her with her family. That's right. Yes. What happened to you in that period? So you you were born and raised in Montego Bay, but you were sent yes. to Kingston to your mum. Well, well, yes, when she came back, she took my sister and I to live with her. And uh, and and then uh, a, approximately a year I was there and then I was sent back to my aunt and father back in Montego Bay. Why were you sent back? I have no idea. <laughs> I still don't know. I, you know, looking back, I think... Um, I was always a child who was respectful, but I asked questions and I would not have been afraid to say, this is not fair. This is not just, you know, so maybe that was a little bit too much to handle because we were still at a stage where children should be seen and not heard. Yeah. Do you know, Um, I mean, can you calculate all these years later how much of an effect that had on you was there enough support around you for that not to be I suppose damaging or kind of uh, affect you too much or well can you reflect and say actually it did have an effect on me you know a big effect oh yes I think I I look back now um I, I remember you know, singing the song, I'm nobody's child. Oh, Rose. <laughs> I know, I sang it, I sang it. You know, just like a flower, I'm growing wild. No mommy's kisses and no daddy's smile. Nobody wants me, I'm nobody's child. <laughs> anyway, yeah, but, but you know, my church family, my church family made the difference because I felt surrounded by love. I was quite, um, had, you know, I was very involved from a very early age. We were reading in church, taking part in the life of church, you know, and you recited poems, you were in the, the church performances at Christmas and Easter. So I was actually well loved within the church family back in Montego Bay. And they were just delighted to have me back. (laughs) Good. (laughs) When you you came to 18, you were 18 from what I understand, and you came as an army chaplain. I I came here to train. Oh, to train. Yes, with the church army. Because from a young age, approximately 14, I felt a sense of calling to ministry. But of course, within the Anglican church, women were not allowed to be priests. We were good enough to clean the altar area, the sanctuary, to put flowers in that area, but we were just not allowed to stand behind the altar and um, and to lead. And I remember a conversation with my bishop when he said to me, Rose, we're Anglicans, we don't do that. And But I smiled in my heart because I felt, God, I know you have called me and I know you do that. So I'm just going to be faithful and wait and, and until the church decides and, and hear the Holy Spirit and respond to the Holy Spirit. So in effect, when I came here to train, I came to train as a church army evangelist. And that is a lay ministry within the Church of England, within Ang- the Anglican Church internationally, um, but began here 
in um, 1882 uh, by a priest, a, 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 a Church of England priest, who was actually the rector at St. Mary at Hill in, uh, um, in London, in the city. And he noticed that when he was standing at the front, he could see more people walking by than those who were inside. Yeah. So he took his trombone and he went outside and played <laughs> and drew a crowd and evangelized them, shared the good news of Jesus with them. And what is interesting was that I eventually ended up also i know yes the minister at that same church place, too. <laughs> same place life yes. has a funny way like that I sometimes know, as I it know. as it has a funny way of you being sure at at such a young age mm. not entirely experienced in the world no. that actually no. the church of england would ordain women into mm. the priesthood which happened eventually yes, yes. in 1994 um, yes you spent over 16 years in Hackney and I'm, I'm really interested in you spending time in an area where throughout that period you will have seen it through good times and not so good times you know problems mm. with poverty rival gangs knife crime but then also through gentrification as well mm -hmm. and the mm. area being improved but the struggle between mm. families who've been there for generations and those yeah. that are very new to the area and that juxtaposition between old and yes. new yes what did you see was your role in that? I think my role was to be a sign of hope, to bring hope, to point people to hope, to, uh, to be a voice for those who were not able to uh, address the, um, those in high places, um, to walk alongside people um and and actually i you know i look back and i i refer to my years in hackney as the best years of my life <laughs> i loved it you know when i left hackney i wept i was not afraid to say that i wept i wept for long after i left there i wept yeah. <laughs> i continued weeping did you um, did you have members of your a congregation well first of all a couple of different things did mm. you have people question their question their faith a lot because times were tough and they were trying to navigate their way through and because it's quite a cosmopolitan borough was it mm. difficult to keep a consistent congregation to have continuity in your congregation no interestingly there was continuity um there was continuity indeed um obviously some people moved away as as um, gentrification came on board and places were being knocked down, so people had to move to to um, to uh, make way for that. But you know, the church is the one place where you will find a, a, um, a doctor, um, a, a, you know, be they surgeon or consultant, sitting in the same pew. Um, with someone who is a cleaner or a carer. You know, it's the one place where you have uh, people from all different walks of life, shoulder to shoulder, engaging mm. in that context, behind after church, having a cup of tea or coffee. Um, or if there were Saturday fates, again, mingling and mixing. So uh, f for me, it was an amazing time there lots of challenges uh, young people you know while i was there we had uh, one of the riots that happened um it's been you know you've seen things um that you probably wouldn't see in other places in terms of the police constantly stopping and searching and and they you know you listen to the mothers and you feel the despair, you know, you go into the schools and in the schools, youngsters are excluded. And you're trying to not only to bring hope, but also to say there is a different way. Also to say we can't just blame 
an organization for what we are seeing. But all of us must take responsibility. Mm -hmm. Every time a child dies on our street, we cannot just, you know, say, oh, you know, it's poor parenting or it is uh, the, the mayor's fault. You know, I wish we would stop all that politicking and, and, and realize that unless we address this more holistically, we're going to continue seeing more children um, on our streets yeah. dying. So you would yeah. call for a joining up of thought, a joining up of, yeah. of different resources and different organizations. Joining up with, with schools, yeah. with the police, yeah. with you know, social services, youth um, um, workers, etc. Yes, and you, families. You, you famously um, protested um, uh, because you didn't have enough money for your to repair your church roof and I, I gather this was fairly early on um, yes. and so up you went on top of the roof of the church to make a point to the local <laughs> council that if they were going to gentrify the area and encourage all this money and all these you know mm. expensive city type people into the area that actually your church needed some much needed attention mm. as well did you get what you were after do you know i wish I actually went on the roof not thinking that uh, about the, the consequence of, of it. I just thought, my goodness, it was pouring down with rain, walked into the church and blow me down. It was like a river running through it, water pouring off the roof. And I was so cross. I remember thinking, gosh, they're putting, you know, they're putting in all these new homes, etc. And nobody thinks about this place and what it offers to the community. And so I went up there to protest, yes. And actually people were phoning from all over the world, from <laughs> Canada, here, there, and everywhere, and, and, and donating money. And foolishly, had I thought about it, I would have stayed on the roof <laughs> until all the money came in. But, but we raised a significant amount of money and we were able to get the, the work done. Uh, we were able to get the work wow. done, yes. <laughs> um, now, in 2019, you became Bishop of Dover. This is mm. despite an interview that I dug out of you in 2014. You were speaking to Kirsty Young on Desert Island Discs. And this oh, is dear. what you said about serving as a bishop. Okay. I have no ambition to be a bishop whatsoever. Truly? Truly. I've never really sat down and given any thought to it. Do you think we'll see women bishops by the end of 2014? I hope it may be possible. I live in hope. You know, I think the church has been the poorer, actually, for not having the gifts of women, men and women, in its leadership. And I think it's about time we change that. Yes. <laughs> Predictive words again, Rose, for you and your <laughs> insight into what's going to happen. How does it make you feel listening to that clip? It probably takes you back to that period of life oh, as well, right? Certainly, it certainly took me back. It was, it was um, recorded. That was recorded um, a couple of days or so after Nelson Mandela died. Yes, I remember it. Mm. I remember it so vividly. And, and, and yes, honestly, you know, I just love serving in the community, preaching, speaking, and sharing God's good news. And so, you know, I certainly wasn't sitting down and pondering and thinking, you know, I want to be a bishop. I think a bishop should be called by the community to serve um, and not someone saying, I, you know, look at me, I want to be a bishop. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> women ordained, able to be ordained in 94, um, 2015, women able to become bishops. Has the church finally caught up with equality? Um, I think the church, if, it, if, the, if I'm being honest, I think the church still struggles on the issue of, if we want to call it equality. Um, I, I, I don't even think of it in terms of equality. I just think of it as just justice um you know that as long as you are baptized you know you should be able to respond to god's call whatever that calling is and i think as i said back then in that interview that it is it has been to the detriment of the church 
that we did not do it for so many years. We've lost so much and we're playing catch up in terms of women's ministry. I recall someone once saying to me that I should prove to them that God has called me. <laughs> and, and I just basically said to him, I'm sorry, I have no intention of proving anything to you. You can either accept me in my ministry or you can reject me. The choice is yours. He said, just call me Bishop. Uh, <laughs> um, going back a little bit, in mm. 2010, you became the first female chaplain to the Speaker of the House of Commons, mm. John, John Burko at that time. Yes, yes. Um, and at the time, the story was that he'd refused to give the job to the candidate picked by the Dean of Westminster Abbey. He chose you instead uh, because he objected to appointing another predictable middle-aged white man. Is that well, true, do you know? I... <laughs> well, I can only tell you what I know, what I am aware of. Um, 90, I think it was about 97 people that applied for the job. And uh, six of us were shortlisted and interviewed. And uh, it has always been that the Speaker of the House of Commons has the last say in terms of the choice, you know, because after all, that's the role, chaplain to the Speaker of the House of Commons. Yes, the person also is attached to Westminster Abbey and is uh, uh, the, the rector of St. Margaret's Church there. But the main task has always been with the, the Speaker. And so it's, it's always, it has always been the Speaker's prerogative. Now, I suspect that if I was white and male, and the choice was being made between two white male, I suspect that we would not have heard a dicky bird about it. And, and, and they would have probably still chosen um, the speaker's um, choice. But on this occasion, I wasn't white and male. And, uh, and so, you know, one, one part said, you know, we want somebody else. And, and the speaker said, I'm sorry, I want her. And, and I can tell you, you know, that if they, the, the, the interviewing panel were quite an eminent group of people, we had Lord Hurd, we had the Prime Minister's Secretary, we had the Archbishop's Appointment Secretary, we, you know, so if they had put me on the list out of, um, oh, let's just, you know, pop this woman there, this black woman there, you know, so clearly my paperwork had to have been good for me to have been yeah. shortlisted. So I don't get excited at the thought that, you know, oh, you know, they're choosing somebody who isn't qualified or capable, you know, as a matter of fact, uh, you know, Mr. S Mr. Speaker, was convinced and and he is he's a great delight he's a so, great delight so dish the dirt <laughs> on John Burko then what was it like he working is a with him? fabulous man I can tell you he is a fabulous man on many occasions I've said to him you know he's Jewish um uh, by by birth and on many occasions, I have said to John, John, you have exhibited, you know, so many Christian virtues, um, you know, that it warms my heart. He is a good and decent human being. He is very funny. He loves his tennis. He loves his football with Arsenal. And, and, and the uh, you know, I personally found him to be a decent humane person mm, because there Very, have been allegations of bullying leveled uh, against him as well I, so, i'm afraid i i saw no sign of that yeah. and i can tell you yeah. that if i if i saw any sign of that i would have challenged him yeah, i course. will tell you i will tell you that but i found him to be compassionate and humane that's what i found from him you left that role as chaplain to the House Speaker uh, in, in the final few months of 2019 to become yes. Bishop of Dover. At that time in Parliament, of course, we saw 
the prorogation of Parliament, some really ugly scenes in the House of Commons. John Burko pinned to his seat to stop him from moving and suspending Parliament, M female MPs in tears. Were you were you there for that period and was there, uh, was there any involvement of you in that? How did your role I'm, work? I'm just trying to remember whether that happened when I... Mm. Left. It I was could... towards the end of 2019, so I'm not sure if it, yes. if it I, I, overlapped I'd or left, not. I left in end of October. Um, uh, I, I left Parliament, so I can't mm. remember. But I was very much aware that those things were happening. Yeah. You know, I suspect that had, uh, had Brexit not been the kind of Brexit that we had, I suspect we would not have heard any of these allegations um, that's been made. Yeah. Um, you led calls for the Church of England to apologise for its role in slavery. It did, but it didn't do it until 2020. Uh, the Church of England have apologised for their historic links to slavery. Um, the Church have called it a source of shame. But there's been a reaction from some Caribbean countries who've just said, look, it's, it's good that you've apologised, but actually we need you to make amends now. Perhaps institutions like the church and like the Bank of England who profited from slavery should sit down with Caribbean nations to fund development projects, for example, uh, a way of giving back some of some of that wealth that was plundered mm. from those mm. nations. Do you, do you agree with those nations and should the church be doing more? I think you will find it quite interesting if you find, you know, some of the addresses or interviews that I did, that I, one of the things that I said is that I was not convinced that, or, or personally, I wasn't personally asking for an apology. The organizations that I was involved with talked about an apology. Personally, I wasn't asking for an apology because for me, apology is just words. Hmm. It, it's just words. It is good to have the apology, but at the end of the day, what we want to see is action. And I think it is right when we're saying, when, when we hear it being said, that we want the church, we want organizations, we want the West um, to look again about how we assist those countries that we plundered. And, and I think it, it, it is right for us to, to ask those questions. Because the reality is that the experiences we're having now is as a result, the racism that exists now is as a result of what happened back then. We are living uh, uh, the, the, the results of that particular period. In, in, in our lives. And, um, you know, the movements of people, the movements of people, you know, those who are saying, oh, we don't want those people here. Do they understand how the West got wealthy? Yeah. Do they understand that Africa was the most richest continent in terms of natural resources, that that has all been taken, taken, and not reinvested back in those places in any real way. And so, you know, I, I want, you know, here I am in, in Canterbury Diocese where we have Dover, where people are coming across the channels. I want us not just to put sticking plasters on. I don't want to hear the, the, the political rhetoric that you see being thrown around between Britain and France or, or between amongst our political leaders. What I want to see is a concentrated, intentional effort with the either um, channel through the United Nations where we begin to sit down and say, what is happening in those countries Why people are moving? If it is war, what are we doing to contribute to that war going on? What might we be able to stop? What kind of peace, uh, peace work can we do in those places? If it is because um, uh, the, the crop isn't uh, providing for families, whatever it is, I want the West 
who took so much from other places to begin to say, let's look at how we can help those countries, yeah. work with their leaders so that people don't feel, everybody wants to be able to look after themselves and their families. You know, why did we think the British went to the Americas and all over the world? Because they wanted to make a better life for themselves. That's why they went to Australia, New Zealand, the Americas, the Caribbean, Africa. So now that they've done it, then they've suddenly said, hey, we did it and we prospered, but we don't want you to come and prosper in the same way. Yes. That's wrong. Yeah. That yeah. is wrong. There is, uh, there is a, yeah, a, a big irony about that, isn't there? It, it is. Yeah. Um, let's finish up by talking about the Church of England and making it sustainable as well. Um, the Times last weekend saw plans drawn up by the Church of England that proposed increasing the size of the diocese of each bishop, but also uh, to have bishops with no specific patch. So instead, the proposal was that you might have a, a bishop who would champion an issue that, that they're passionate about. And the suggestion in this in this um, document that the Times saw was that you might have a COVID bishop, for example. So not in charge of a diocese, but a COVID bishop or a Brexit bishop. And they're essentially trying to address the issue of how you future proof the church with dwindling congregations, trying to keep the institution relevant. Have you got your own ideas about that, Rose? Do you know, the, the church has got to ask questions. They've got to ask questions about how we um, not just survive, but how we thrive. That's what we need to ask. How do we thrive as a church? And the way we're going to thrive, the way we're going to thrive as a church is when we live the good news that we profess and we proclaim. That's when we're going to thrive. And, and, and what we see in this country is often a church that is lacking in confidence about who we are and what we believe. I love to compare it with the religion of football or sports, yes, some other sports yes. or, you know, and you see because the same- Because you've got a ready-made audience there and that's it, isn't yeah, it? The church you know, needs that, needs that devout the, audience. The, the, uh, absolutely. You see in, in sports, the passion and the, the excitement. And then the same people who expresses that passion, and excitement, they come to church and they're, you know, they're mm. very uh, quiet, you know, they, they, they leave and it's as if nothing happened. And what I'm saying is, let us deepen our lives of prayer and scripture. Let us be excited about the gospel ourselves and what it means. What does it mean? You know, what difference does it make that we are children of God, that we are people of faith about how we live, about how we relate to the world around us? And, and, you know, care for those who are most vulnerable. And let's be excited about being a person of faith. Because it is only when we are excited about our own faith that we are going to draw others in. Yes. It's here in the diocese, we talk about changed lives, changing other lives. So we need to be light. You the need to see of, it to be it. You need to be that's, it to see it. Or that's precisely Whichever way around it. it is, you need to show it in order it. to attract people. And, and people, aren't, people aren't seeing it because we don't have the confidence to say, I believe, and this is what I believe. 